What is the secret of success? To lift the line from my favorite film, it's about discovering what you love and doing it for the rest of your life. For one man, that is the world of mining, where its relationship to the land, people, and culture is as embedded as minerals in the earth. Join me as I go beneath the surface to explore the world and evolving legacy of engineer Eulalio Austin here on Thought Leaders. Eels, thank you so much for hosting us. This is actually a very interesting place. You were looking at being 9,000 meters above sea level, but 500 meters underground. Tell us about the world of mining and what it meant for you when you were growing up in the mountain province. Actually, mining is a uh, part of uh, the culture of the Cordilleras. If you've been hearing that small-scale miners came from the Cordilleras, and uh, when I was still young, uh, never in my dream to become a miner. But because of the prodding of my father, I went into mining. My father happens to have a brother who is in the mining industry that time that earns more than my father. And my uncle is not even a high school graduate. So you were seeing this as, a, as an economic benefit also, and at, at least you had the comparison also within your family. Yeah, because when, I, when my father mentioned about it, I tried to do some research on it. And uh, I came to know that uh, fifth-year mining engineering students are being offered a job already from the mining companies. So it's, it's, it's interesting. This was a career path laid out for you. There were a few people who traced it already for you. Can you tell us about your decision to go to St. Louis University and how that influenced your mindset when you were growing up in Baguio also? Uh, because of the scholarship program that I was able to avail from government, uh, I pursued mining engineering because uh, if you heard about gold, and it's uh, some sort of another story. And, uh, uh, my first time in the mines, when during, during college days that we were allowed to visit the uh, actual mining companies, and I saw really gold. Was this part of your OGT or your training? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, prior to graduation, you have to spend uh, 60 days in the mining industry. And uh, I find mining to be a very challenging job. Were there any surprises for you when you first stepped into a mine? You've heard about it all this time. It's part of your culture. It's part of the people's relationship to the land. What was any different from the time you first saw it? Actually, the miner is a very unique worker because uh, they live in a dark environment and uh, they would always uh, make it a point to do some joking while they are doing work. And uh, as you quit from work, part of the job is always joking. And uh, I think it's one way of uh, trying to relieve ourselves from so the to danger. cope really from, from, from the, from the danger of the job. Yeah. Well, this is an essential but a very difficult and controversial industry. As you went into the mining sector, did you feel any regret or um, hesitation coming in knowing that all you know now? Actually, one, one disappointment was I never knew that metal prices are in a cycle. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. And during down times, you need to squeeze costs or some sort of you know, to defer some projects. And when I went up the corporate ladder, I also encountered these anti-mining sentiments. And uh, I think it's but part of the mining industry being highly attacked industry because of its uh, effect on the environment. But uh, with the advent of responsible mining, I think there are mitigating measures to these fears of these anti-mining people. So you'll tell us about your first days in the mining industry. You went underground. Tell us about the culture there. Tell us about uh, any culture shock that you might have had in terms of work and how you coped with it. Actually, when I, my, in, when I first entered underground, what I have in mind is if you're an engineer or you're a supervisor, people would follow you. But it's entirely different because uh, there's a lot of bullying in the underground because most of the workers are, say, the, the work, the miners are not so much uh, into education and they are just, uh, they went into the job because it's, hard, hard much job. And uh, I need to work with these people because you cannot just implement what you will be saying, taking into account my physical uh, capabilities when the guys are 
much taller, much taller, much bigger, much bigger, and uh, and you were the new guy, right? So yeah. they were probably thinking, what is this new guy trying to tell us here? Even with the newly minted engineering degree, how did you cope and learn to work with them? I think it's uh, through learning, through hard work, knowing what they're doing, knowing the details of the job, knowing the engineering aspects of the job, that you would earn the respect of these uh, workers. And regardless of rank, how did you uh, build these relationships across the different parts of the organization? It's uh, understanding really the culture of each uh, worker because the mining industry or the mining company, Felix, as one, is a melting pot of different cultures. We have Bicolanos, we have Bilocanos, we have Pangasinenses, we have Tagalogs. And you have to learn how to live with these guys because it has its own different uh, culture. And uh, I think drinking with them, uh, going along with them, you would uh, come to learn about how they live as Ilocanos, as Pangasinenses, as Tagalogs, as Bicolanos. That's, that's really fascinating. You brought actually uh, an education in terms of cross-cultural management underground already. My question is, how do you take that with you as you transition from operations into the, an executive path like you did at Felix? Actually, it's a hard, it's a hard, uh, Transformation, cute to speak about it, because during the times that I'm in the in the operations, I deal with the different kind of people. But as you go the corporate ladder, you also have to inculcate the cultures or the educational attainments of your managers as you go up. And uh, I think it helped a lot of understanding how people behave, how people would listen to orders, how people would uh, accept uh, criticism, how people would learn uh, or accept recommendations. And, I think it uh, it helped me a lot also going up the corporate ladder, talking with my with higher people in the company. It's fascinating that beyond the operational discipline and the structure of that, you're actually looking at cross-cultural, uh, interpersonal relationships, how to build that. My question is, did you have a mentor as you transitioned from the world of operations underground to the boardroom and the executive offices above ground? Actually, I would thank the company because when I was being groomed to be promoted in higher positions, I went into management schools, uh, AIM, uh, Harvard, and other management trainings that helped me because I, for one, it came from the operations, doesn't know about the economics of a business. That's why I think uh, I owe it a lot to my superiors because uh, they trained me to be prepared to these higher positions. Well, let's talk about your role as a leader as you transition into the corporate boardroom and the C-class and the executive office, shall we? Yeah. Okay, you'll uh, yeah. shop. Let's go. Previous managers would always uh, embrace the culture of uh, they call this, uh, this iron hand. But when I went up the ladder, I said, I think it should not be that way. There would be instances that you use your iron hand. There would be instances that uh, you use the democratic approach. <laughs> I wanted to understand also, um, it's, not, uh, it's not typical that people stay with a job for more than 10 years or even five years with the millennial age right now. How did you foresee your career at that time? Did you really want to go up the ladder in terms of just one company or did you look back and say, I could have done differently? I had to go back to where I came from, Quintin, because um, my father is a public school teacher he reached that level of a district supervisor and he was trying to take the exams for a superintendent. When I joined the mining company, the highest ambition that I have is a mine superintendent. A mine superintendent is the one that runs the underground. And that was my only ambition in life, just to become a mine superintendent. And I would pursue the dreams of my father because my father was just a district supervisor and he wants to be a superintendent. If I'll become a mine superintendent, I think that I would be very, very happy. But and yet, <laughs> you went beyond that. It was a continuous. Tell, tell, tell us how you broke through. Um, was it something about the working in the operations, or was it because you learned skills outside the mine that really made you succeed as now as an executive, not just a, an operations person? 
I think it was a combination kind thing because uh, when I was in the operations, I was pulled out once in a while to the surface. Say, so not not a full time underground worker because I have to I have to help them in the planning part of the the operations. And I think more of more of my development, I could say, it was from the underground because there I could uh, I have to learn how to deal with miners how to issue out orders so that uh, at the end of the day miners would follow it and uh, the 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 aspects of working 24 hours for in there should be no loss of communication not so much of a big help yeah because lives are at stake and all yeah. that so 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 all in all when you made that transition to uh, an executive position what skills do you think you needed to learn and how did you go about building those skills to transition from uh, you know PPE equipment into a suit and tie in a barong? <clears throat> Actually, that's a very good uh, question because when I was asked to assume this position, I have one issue in mind, dealing with uh, government regulators and politicians. Because as a mining engineer, you, should, you just go and see the rocks. Go and, exactly. But when I was promoted to this position, I, I told myself that uh, how could I address that issue of uh, doing PRs with the uh, regulators, and uh, I, I, I mentioned that to our bosses that uh, it seems that uh, one weakness that I have to work at would be this dealing with government regulators. This is sometimes even harder than dealing with the underground, right? Correct, <laughs> because, uh, you know, I deal with politicians and blah, blah, blah. And I think uh, I have started to learn my way on that through, you know, I think it's more of uh, broadening your network and knowing these people and dealing with them. And then, I think it's, uh, but I'm still working my way up there. Oh, you're still learning. Yeah. Yules, there's a chance that as an executive, you're able to shape the culture. I mean, I know you had corporate values already in Felix, but how did you go about also changing things to what you thought was right in terms of your leadership and how the corporate culture would evolve? I, when when um, uh, I talk over at the mine side, previous managers would always uh, embrace the culture of uh, what they call this, uh, this iron hand. But when I went up the ladder, I said, I think it should not be that way. Uh, there would be instances that you use your iron hand. There would be instances that uh, you use the democratic approach. And because you are now dealing with uh, 20, 20th century workers and 21st century workers. And these you, have are to be, two, you have to be flexible and yeah, adaptable. Yeah. These are two different uh, kinds of worker. And uh, I think I was able to I'm sure to promote the culture of uh, doing doing a hybrid. Now I'm fascinated to know how you balance all this, uh, this you know these long hours at the office and at the mine site with growing a beautiful family. Tell us about your family and how are you able to balance the harsh work of the shafts and the cuddies and the boardroom with a gentle life at home with your family and your community. Actually, in my first uh, few years as a mining engineer. I work uh, 24 hours a day and uh, almost uh, six days a week. And there were times that I could only see my family during Sundays and we go to mass during Sundays. And during holidays that I am allowed to go to, to go on holiday off, uh, I would find time cooking for my kids and uh, I would uh, cook their favorite uh, dinuguan na manok. I would always uh, cook uh, that pinapaitan for that... Uh, Which is a Cordillera it, special. Yeah, yeah, it stands for that cow and then... But I have to make it a point that during New Year's Day and Christmas Day, I have to be with my family. Now, the question I have is, when you look at your family and you look at your life ahead, how do you actually retain that work-life balance right now, now that you're the head of the company? I make it a point, uh, I make it a point, uh, that I would strike a balance because uh, yes the demands of my current position is uh, that uh, uh, all is uh, so demanding as a, as a president of the company and CEO looking into the growth of the company I make it a point always uh, kahit uh, mahirap yan I have to, to see my children once in a while well, let's, let's, let's uh, boil this down to the level of experience because a lot of our viewers want to see how a leader really is able to balance that. Tell us about a day in the life of Yulalio Austin. Let's say a Friday, uh, close to the weekend. How, how does your day look? Actually, I would, uh, I would uh, tell my wife this would be our, our schedule during the weekend. 
I would say that I want to play golf in the morning, go for dinner in the afternoon. Then Sunday morning, we go to Mass. And then ma uh, Sunday afternoon, stay at home and do some bonding. That's, that's how... And that's you have how. a set schedule. So it, sounds like, a, it sounds like you've engineered your that, week just to make sure you have a cozy home with your family. That's how I strike a balance in my life. I would wish someday, Quintin, that um, stakeholders of the mining industry, the IPs, the LGUs, the regulators, owners of uh, the companies would sit down together and address this issue of uh, mining per se as uh, being destructive to the environment because at the end of the day, responsible mining is being adopted by other mining companies, by other countries. And I think mining would be a very good aspect for alleviating poverty in the countryside. So Yos, I'm fascinated to know how you want to change the mindsets of people about mining. I mean, I think it was a late Nelson Mandela said, if you can't grow it, you have to mine it. And yet the impressions here are very, very polarizing. How do you as the head of the largest mining firm in the Philippines plan to change that mindset? I think it's more on massive information dissemination because uh, mining after all is not that destructive, but there are people who would always insist in these people in not even see a mine. And I think it's a, it's a massive information dissemination. Ask these people to go to uh, mining sites who are practicing, which are practicing a responsible mining and see for themselves what mining is. Now, Yules, one of the things that people remember in recent history is your crisis management of a major accident, which is, you know, sometimes unavoidable in the mining industry. Tell us about that accident and how you were able to decide and make key moves to address that concern. Actually, Quintin, uh, the biggest issue there is uh, the emotions of people. Because when the accident happened, uh, most of the people at the mine site were thinking that the mine will close. And uh, you could just imagine the social displacement that it would cause. And, uh, the first thing I would, uh, I would, I have done was uh, really to look into this aspect of uh, the emotional aspect of this problem, and I have to convince these people that this problem can be solved. We could resume operations, provided we have to work together and solve this problem. Because uh, while it would be, there are some repercussions of this uh, this incident to our image as responsible miners. We have to rebuild that image as responsible miners, and I have to deal with that. Uh, that emotional aspect of these workers, and I was, I was able to convince them that uh, we could uh, resume operations. It seemed like a perfect storm when you had everyone coming at you, the regulators, the NGOs, the media. How did you learn from the experience? What did you learn from this experience? And how would you apply it going forward as you build the legacy in Felix? Actually, Kintin, uh, I think that uh, incident was a very good one for me. Uh, it's part of my learning curve. I was just uh, a year uh, occupying that position and actually the tailings incident if we had not been advocates of responsible mining could be very very difficult for us but because of the investments that we have done in the community in adherence to uh, environmental regulations so you get a bank of goodwill yeah people. we have this uh, bank of goodwill that uh, we were able to tell these people that yeah that incident happened but we are going to fix that. And uh, the IPs were behind us, the regulators were behind us, the local government units was behind us. Behind us. That's why we, uh, we didn't have a hard time convincing the regulators that uh, we should resume operations after fixing that mess. You have these practices in place. Tell, give us an example of one practice in place that you feel can make environmental care and responsible mining and operations compatible. The adherence to this uh, tailings dump, the reforestation projects that uh, the mining companies are doing are, I think, worthwhile, uh, worthwhile endeavors that uh, we should uh, broadcast or show to these people in the Cordillera. Yeah, it seems to me also that the watersheds in mining areas are actually thicker and more malago compared to the ones outside. How do you work with the regulators to show that, yes, we are a force for good? 
you know, that's always been an issue to these IPs. That if there's a mining company coming and said, uh, our waters will be depleted, our waters will be contaminated. But I think there are, with the advent of technology, there are engineering solutions to that kind of thing. And uh, yes, uh, contamination of waters could be avoided by adhering to, there are set principles on that, standards that uh, this mining industry should follow because as I can remember, uh, mining companies are not allowed to dispose water to the national streams if they are not complying with the standards set by government. In terms of depleting waters, I think uh, that uh, that aspect should be looked into by mining companies because even if there are no mining activities right now at the Cordilleras, Baguio for one has no water. Right? And uh, I think there should be another solution to that because uh, in in other mining companies, I have heard that in Brazil, they would pump water from the sea to supply the requirements of the community. And it involves involvement, but it's, I think, balancing, striking a balance between the needs of the IPs and, or the constituents with the income of the company. As you go forward and you look into the next chapter of your life, what kind of legacy do you want to leave with both Felix and the mining industry in terms of what it can contribute to the country? I would wish someday Quintin, that um, stakeholders of the mining industry, the IPs, the LGUs, the regulators, owners of uh, the companies would sit down together and address this uh, issue of uh, mining per se as uh, being destructive to the environment because at the end of the day, responsible mining is being adopted by other mining companies, by other countries. And I think mining would be a very good aspect for alleviating poverty in the countryside. Let's come full circle with your childhood and the place you grew up. How do you see the Cordillera in the next 10 to 15 years and in a generation with the footprint that you've left behind? With the massive exploration works that we are doing at Patkal, with the coming in of gold fields the far southeast, you know that Gintin, that's a world-class mine. And there are also explorations within the areas of Kalinga, Apayao, and uh, part of Benguet. I think Benguet would be a premier mining, mining destination in the future. Well, it seems like you've had a road that has brought you all the success, the challenges, the lessons, the values that you've learned. But there's also a difficult road that was full of opportunity ahead, and I wish you all the best with that, especially as your role as a leader of the largest mining company in the Philippines and a visionary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you also. Yulalia Austin has certainly come a long way from his humble beginnings. It's an amazing journey filled with lessons in leadership forged in the underground mine, in a corporate boardroom, in a regenerated forest, and the enfolded arms of a community that he hopes to leave better than he found it. Join us again next week as we explore the minds and the moves of the countries and regions most successful people. Mm -hmm.